Security stay solvent. Privatization, raising minimum age levels, reducing coal increases, or some other measure. Reducing coal increases? A cost of living increase. No problem. I would say pretty much all of the above. Uh, not being an expert in this field, but I do know that I think there's waste and abuse in the Social Security system. I think um, there are some seniors that are worth millions of dollars that shouldn't even get a Social Security check, in my opinion. I did a job for a man that owned nine McDonald's out here, and he said, I don't need that check. He's probably worth $30 million at least. But he was being very honest. I'm saying there's fraud and there's entitlement mentality that's, that's killing the entire country at every level. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. And specifically, you said all of the above would be on the table. Sure. All of the, the above would be on the table to fix it. Yeah, the cost of living, uh, I, I need, I, I'm not totally okay. up on the cost of living, uh, okay. the cola, but. When we look at the social security problem, we need to not just say how we're going to fix it, but how did it happen? Where did the money go? Under the Carter administration, there was a we, we had a huge amount of money. I believe seniors today should be getting and would have been able to get twice as much as your checks are now. But what happened? The Carter administration thought it would be a good idea to extend these benefits to illegal aliens, people that are foreign nationals that are not in this country. We ex we've extended these benefits beyond who they were originally intended for. They were intended for the people that work and contribute, and that's it. And if it would have been kept that way and protected, we'd have the money today. But we haven't changed that practice, so we do need to fix the program. Even though it's broke, we gotta, we've got to make some changes to where only the people paying in that are U.S. citizens are entitled to, the, to uh, receive their, their benefits. With that said, um, and then what do we do? I do believe in the privacy privatization part. I think we need to do that and the cost of living increases. So that's it. Well, there's a Democrat here. I'm not ready to say any of those things about Social Security. I'm not ready to say that, folks. There's, there has to be some other ways we can take care of business here. Um, our seniors have paid into the system. Um, we all know a senior, and it's going to be very, very soon that we, every one of us up here is going to be a senior. I've paid into the system. When I'm ready to tap into mine, I want it there, and I want it. And just like you, you guys want yours, I want mine. I'm already getting my applications for the senior stuff, and Mrs. Pinkerton is too. Okay? We're already looking down the road. So... There must be other ways. We need more employment in this country. And are you saying something? No, no. Okay, all right. Okay. Oh, uh, let me follow up. So it's some other measure was the answer. Do you have that measure or would you have to explore? I think it needs to explore. I think we, if we, everything needs to be looked into. I don't think Social Security is one of those things we put on the table. Okay? I don't believe that. I don't be, believe public education is one of those things we put on the table. There are some things too important to put on the table. Health care. You got one body. Okay. Well, thank you, Heidi. Thank you. Kenan Adams. And then we'll start with you on the next one. Okay, first and foremost, I do think that when you do uh, keep the promise to the seniors that are currently participating in the system, I think this is a big problem with talking about COLAs and, and adjustments to the system is that we've made a promise and we have a responsibility to keep that promise going forward. So when we talk about these reforms, I think the reforms need to occur. They need to occur with the generation who are currently participating in the system by way of paying into it, who are not receiving the benefits yet. The reality is, and you know this, the system was designed for people who are supposed to die around 65 or 75 years of age. We all understand exactly how the system was set up and we know that's not true today. So we're having a massive drawdown, and I think um, Mr. Mitzelfeld correctly pointed out the fact that the system is bankrupt. It is largely bankrupt because we don't have the ability to put enough dollars back in as we're taking out. We must fundamentally reform the system, but we need to make sure that we first and foremost keep the promise to the people that have already um, received that promise and are expecting to be treated fairly. Um, so we'll go with you. That's because y'all trying to do it yourself. Y'all need to take it to Jesus and let the Lord work it out. 
All right, I have no problem with Jesus being involved. Uh, Canada Adams moved. Canada Adams, we're going to move to um, something that was bipartisan. Um, this, when we were going through the raising of the debt limit, there was a, a Bull Simpson uh, committee and a gang of six, and they came up with a approach that would support cuts to spending and tax increases. Um, is that, is that, would you be supportive of Bowles Simpson? Actually, no. The way Bowles, uh, Bowles system was currently constructed is it has an awful lot of massive reforms that all have to work in conjunction with, with the, the, le the body of the legislation in order to make that work. It, it is an interesting idea, but it envisions a, a fix that is far, far too difficult to do in one single piece of legislation. I think ultimately there is not a person in this room who would who would disagree that the state of, of our uh, federal government is one of an overspending mentality. And I think we have to look at how we can reduce the size of the federal government's budget before we start looking at, at eliminating uh, tax breaks and eliminating cuts and eliminating a lot of the things that people have come to rely on. We can do with tax uh, with tax incentivization what a lot of things were that were envisioned in the Bowles Simpson amendment, but that legislation itself is far too onerous to try to be enacted and uh, expect there to be legitimate reforms. Thank you. Would you be supportive of Bowles Simpson, a bipartisan effort that combined cuts in spending and tax increases to help reduce the deficit? We all know there needs to be some cuts. And I agree to there being some cuts. I want to be very, very, very careful what things we look at to cut. Um, if you look at uh, the, uh, we've done a little statistical looking at, at the area. If we get too deep into government cuts, we're talking, we're cutting flesh from bone. I mean, we got, we looked at Barstow, 4,000 people employed in the military. That's a government venture, folks. Uh, 600 people are in the school system. Those are government ventures. And if you look around here, there's a lot of things in the desert that are government. I'm not going to be a slasher like that. Thank you. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. The, the question was, would you support the cuts to spending and tax increases as outlined in the bipartisan Bowles, Simpson, and Gang of Six reports? to make meaningful budget reform? Yeah. For the, uh, yeah. that's Absol it. Absolutely not. There's, as citizens, we're already overtaxed. And there's, we always talk about comp uh, compromise, reaching across the aisle. I'm just not gonna be a candidate that's gonna do that. We've gone way too far to the left and we need to come back to the right. This government is far overreaching. I believe in limited government. I believe in small government. This government simply just costs too much money. We have to make serious cuts, and we actually need to move to give tax breaks to our citizens to revive our economy. So I would not be in favor of it. Thank you. I haven't read I haven't read Bull Simpson, but just on the face of what you said, raising taxes, I, I think we should avoid that at all costs. Uh, I think that's counterproductive. Um, it's discouraging, and eventually, it's debilitating. Uh, because all it's going to do is just go up some more because you can keep doing it. I think we should really totally revamp all of our entitlement system. I think that's at the heart of the problem. Everything from government officials flying around with jets all over the world, uh, spending God knows how much money, or taxpayer money on vacations and so forth. Uh, I think some of these government officials spend their own money and instead of charging taxpayers. Uh, I think the welfare system, we need a, a safety net, obviously. People are hurting out there. But where do you draw the line? And, and what are the means testing you're doing to just write and start cutting checks to people? And food stamps is abused, I believe. And uh, it, just the very basic things, if you start really getting into it, you're going to see. Thank you very much. Dr. Bull Simpson, would you be supportive? Well, <coughs> Well, the answer to that is uh, yes and no. Old Simpson was a wonderful effort. It was bipartisan, and the point of it was that it was going to be something that was going to be adopted, more or less, because it was bipartisan. 
and it involved both expenditure and spending and also tax revenues and so on and so forth. And of course, it was rejected out of hand by the current administration. None of the proposals in both the Simpson have been adopted. The other thing, one other point that I would like to make is that we have to stop thinking in terms of cutting uh, uh, expenditures in the sense of cutting the military budget. As short a time ago as the Vietnam era, a time of Vietnam era, the, the expenditure was very, very high in the military. It's not that anymore. It's very small, so you can't cut that anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that, that whole uh, Gang of Six was set up to fail from the very beginning, and I, I'm not supportive of the Bull Simpson and, and what they were trying to do there. Uh, I've signed the uh, American Taxpayer Protection Pledge. I will not vote to raise taxes. Uh, and I think that spending is completely out of control in Washington, D.C. And the only thing that we're going to do to be able to get the federal budget and the deficit and the debt under control is to cut. We just have to cut. But one thing I absolutely refuse to vote to cut is our, our uh, defense uh, budget. I think there are efficiencies that can be achieved in the defense budget. But training of our soldiers, the fundamental thing that defends the very freedom that we have to be here today, I absolutely will not vote to cut. The problem with these bipartisan commissions is that it's much easier to produce a report that ends up on a shelf than it is to pass laws, or especially comprehensive legislation. And, and so it, it, this really wasn't a realistic uh, outcome. You know, uh, we need more people in Congress that have solid general principles that believe that with smaller government and a bigger economy that we can solve our problems. Ronald Reagan and JFK both showed that tax cuts produce more growth that make the economy bigger. And, and I'm a big believer in that. I also signed the, the Americans for Tax Reform pledge, I will not raise taxes. But we do, uh, uh, we do have to make cuts and make some unpopular choices. I've done that on the Board of Supervisors. We've cut non-general, uh, we've cut general fund non-public safety departments by 50% on my watch. Candidate Jensen. Ladies and gentlemen, the closer you are to the land, the closer you are to the seat to the power of government. In this place out here in the rural area, we are near the land, and you are near picking a congressman that will go to Washington, D.C. and translate a message. Yes, the Bold, the bold Simpson Act had some bold characteristics, and excluding the democratic element of raising taxes, there are bold things that need, be, need to be done, real-world situations that need to be handled. If you look closely at that, you'll find that Paul Ryan on the Budget Committee and this senator that came from Montana are really looking to end the IRS intrusion and go to a flat tax. And they're looking at cutting the government spending and shutting down the government. I will see that Social Security is paid, and I will see that the military is paid, but the next time somebody comes to vote to shut down a government, we will bring it to a halt to solve the problem, if that's what it takes. Thank you. Councilwoman Baez. I don't support this act. Um, I don't support increase in taxes at all. As a conservative, I would not support that. Um, yes, to cut spending. We have a lot of illegal immigration here that are taking up um, the money in our budget as far as um, education, benefits, health care. We could be using that for our people. Um, you, you can't, the government needs to learn one simple thing to be successful, is you cannot spend what you don't have. And they haven't learned that. And I know there's money up there, just like I found out there's money in the city, but it's only used when they want to use it, and for whatever purposes, and usually it's for the left. So, uh, no, I don't support that, and I will never cut for military, and I will never cut for um, uh, entitlements such as Social Security. You worked for that. It's too late for the seniors to try to make up that time and that money. You don't take away now. It's wrong. Thank you. Candidate Jensen, you can you will lead this next one. Um, I think this is a timely one, and, and a lot of you have spoken about uh, national security. So, is the U.S. policy of military and economic support to Israel supportive of resolving issues of unrest in the Middle East, or does it create further disruption by making Israel less accommodative to its neighbors? I think that on occasion it has been less accommodative. When we've given just tens of millions of dollars with zero supervision, zero expectation, we don't see any solution come out of the Middle East. 
one of the things that we need to be careful of is that Israel does not dictate U.S. policy. And that is the reverse effect that is happening to us. Israel threatens to attack. Everybody wants to know if the U.S. is going to jump in. We, the people that you elect, the people that are sitting at this table, whoever we are, we will determine the U.S. policy as we proceed forward. We will defend and protect the United States. I taught nuclear, chemical, and biological defensive warfare in the United States Air Force for 20 years. I know what the threat out of Iran is, but I will not let Israel dictate our policy. They have a right to defend themselves, and they should do so. And as an ally, we should be expected to be standing by. But this administration will not do that. We need a new president. We will be the new Congress that comes in. So I ask you to support me because that's the logic and rationale that I will apply. We'll go to the supervisor. When I was in the Middle East in Desert Shield and Desert Storm, we, uh, we were involved in a multi-Arab nation coalition. It was very fragile. And in fact, it was, it was, we, the Syrians used to shoot at us. This never got covered. But they didn't like us and they were next to us. And they used to actually shoot at us. It was pretty annoying. But, you know, at that time, Saddam Hussein was shooting missiles at Israel to try to draw them into the conflict. And Israel, because we asked them to, did, didn't get involved. Now, I would have liked to have had them involved because they have a fantastic military. But, but they didn't. They showed that restraint. They are a great ally. And, and our, whatever we spend to help Israel, a lot of that money goes back into our economy because they use our weapons and our technology. And, and it's a good investment. We don't have to maintain bases there to the extent that we might, because they're there. And, and they're also going to be key for us in dealing with the biggest threat in that region, which is Iran. Real quick, though, just can you clarify, one issue is, is our support, does it help resolve issues of unrest by supporting Israel? Israel is, deals in very good faith with its neighbors, and if you look at the issues carefully, you can see that uh, that the United States should be more supportive, even than it is now, of Israel in relation to its neighbors. Thank you. Mayor? Well, I'll, I'll have to disagree with uh, Bill Jensen. I, I think that uh, if, as Israel goes, so does the United States. And if we are not supportive of their efforts in that region to defend their own nation, then we ought to be very concerned about what could happen to us as a nation. And so I think that the, the way we approach and support Israel is very key to the very freedom that we have here uh, today. And so I'm very supportive of Israel. I don't think that they dictate our policy, but if we're not supportive of Israel, then we've got serious problems. The other day the president leaks out that Israel's looking at attacking Iran. Why is our president so against Israel? We can't stand for this. He needs to go. Okay? And we need to support Israel in everything that they do. Real quick, one quick three right there. Um, so you see Israel as something that keeps the peace, or our support keeps the peace more than creates more unrest. Then. Correct. Because if, if these other nations surrounding Israel get control of that land, <laughs> God help us. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Doctor? Yes, uh, Dave, can I ask you to repeat the question? Yeah. I thought of asking you that when you the first tricky. responder came. It's tricky. It's so complex. Oh, I know. I wrote this one. Okay. <laughs> Is the U.S. policy of military and economic support to Israel supportive of resolving issues of unrest in the Middle East? Or does our support create further disruption by making Israel less accommodative to their neighbors? Well, given the choice between yes and no, I would have to say yes. In other words, we do have to support them. Obviously, uh, Israel, just to mention the key thing to my mind, which is the key problem, is their continuing building of settlements in the East Bank. And, and that is a very, very critical problem and issue. And uh, to my observation and my thinking, Israel and their current administration in Israel is totally unresponsive to our demands and our efforts to get them to uh, resolve that. They refuse to do it. So it's a dilemma for us. That's the word, dilemma. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, not a uh, current administration supporter, but 
what Obama did say recently, we've got to back to the uh, state of Israel. Well, I don't know what he means by that. In my opinion, uh, Israel is our friend, and we're there to protect, protect her, and as we do protect Israel, um, I, I believe it stabilizes the whole region. Because uh, the other guys, the guys that want to kill them and they want to kill us, remember we're dealing with uh, Hamas, we're de dealing with militant Islam, we're dealing with people that don't, don't want us here. And if, and if they think they can just take Israel, then there won't be any stopping. And then who's going to unleash the first nuclear weapon? Nobody wants that, I don't think. Unless you want to have a mass suicide. It's insane. Thank you. Thank you. Can it hide The question, and I'll paraphrase it, is, is does it hurt or help us, or hurt or help Israel, by us being supportive of Israel? Frankly, I don't care, because they're our ally. They're our friend. We support Israel no matter what. Their enemies are our enemies. There's this one little spot of freedman democracy in the Middle East, East is Israel. We fight all over the world for freedom and democracy, and we have to protect it there. So we don't just have Israel's back. We are there with Israel. We fight with Israel. We take whatever stand against their enemies because there are enemies as well. So the answer would be regardless, and we're going to. If we irritate the Middle East because we're there, too bad. Got it. Thank you. This is one of those areas that I'm not going to be on the same page on. I, I'm a Christian. I'm a Sabbath keeper Christian. So I have strong roots in the Judeo-Christian, that whole culture. But I don't think that no matter what Israel does, we've got to be supportive of them. I don't believe that. And this is one area that I think should be on the table for consideration. How much do we want to spend to keep this support? Thank you. Ken Adams? Dave, would you mind repeating the question one more time? Okay, the question is, is the U.S. policy of military and economic support to Israel supportive of resolving issues of unrest in the Middle East? Or does it create further disruption by making Israel less accommodative to its neighbors? That's what I thought. Okay. The reality is, is it's not America's participation that makes the Middle East a, a, a place of unrest and terror. It's the stated policy of the Iranian government to eliminate Israel. They're the problem. Our participation in backing Israel is not the issue. It's people who say our job as Iranians are to eliminate the, the face or Israel off the face of this earth. That's the problem. We have a responsibility, I believe, both a geopolitical and a moral responsibility to back Israel. But, please be clear, I could not disagree more with the idea that anything Israel chooses to do, we should necessarily have their back, because Israel stated that they are actually contemplating legitimately a preemptive nuclear strike on Iran. Do I want to see our world enter that age? Do I want to be responsible for, for backing Israel if they decide to preemptively destroy Iran with nuclear weapons, that could put America in a very, very dangerous place, and I would not be supportive of engaging in a nuclear contest with, uh, with the state of Iran. But I do believe that we have an important responsible, um, responsibility to the state of Israel. Uh, uh, Councilman Baez, and then we'll do the last question starting with uh, uh, Kennedy Pinkerton. Well, I think it's really just common sense to me. I remember 9-11, and it was horrifying to see what happened in this country. So to me, I look at it like, do we want more of them, or do we want more of us? So we back Israel, Israel and we find a president that has some backbone. It's simple. So that would be closer to uh, Kenneth Ives' stances, that you just do it. We just do it. OK. Kenneth Pinkerton, this one is near and dear to Martha's heart, okay, because her mother uh, just had uh, open heart surgery. Uh, there's a lot of, con lot of uh, hubbub about Dick Cheney getting a heart transplant at 71 years old. Um, he suffered his first heart attack at 37, his fifth in 2010. He has stints. He has a wondrous device, as he calls it, a pacemaker. And... Um, 
It says that more than 2,300 uh, transplants were performed last year, and 332 of those people were over the age of 65, while 330 people died waiting for a transplant. The average transplant liver lives over five years, 60% of the time. This is just background to help out. The point is, is there a point when you're too old to receive that kind of care? And who makes that call? You threw me a softball. I thought you was going to be hard on me. Um, my wife last year donated a kidney to our uncle, who was... How old was he? 74. He was a 74, vigorous in every way, except for he had a kidney about to shut down. It, and she stepped forward, and a lot of people, even family, said, that's too doggone old, and we should just let things run its course. He is alive today, a year and a half later, um, very vigorous. Um, so I think that... Uh, in this country, there's no one like, there is, my grandfather taught me this, a World War II veteran. He helped liberate those concentration camps. And he said this, he said, son, there's no one like Americans that value individual life. Thank you. Uh, yeah, let's just do that in a matter of, yeah. The, the straightforward answer, who should be responsible for that decision, is the organ donor registry, the hospitals, the doctor, and the patient. I need to probably say nothing more except that the one person who absolutely shouldn't be a part of that decision is the federal government. Thank you. And I... I'd like to commend Mrs. Pinkerton for doing that for your uncle. That, that was awesome and courageous. So, um, yeah, I agree. I think it is the doctor's, the family's decision. And, um, and I absolutely am opposed to Obamacare. I don't think the federal government should ever dictate any policy or make any decision on life. But our country was based on life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. And if someone needs a heart transplant to enjoy a few more years of life, then they, they absolutely should have that right to do so. Thank you. I have no problem with Dick Cheney. The reason I say Cheney is because that's the way it's supposed to be pronounced. Nobody ever pronounces it that way. Pardon me. <laughs> no, it's okay. You're not alone. I heard an interview with Mrs. Cheney, and she got frustrated, and her husband did too, with, with correcting everyone. So I, I like to pronounce people's names correctly. But that's how I learned, by right, hearing it from her. But yeah, I have no problem with uh, heart transplants. Um, I don't know exactly how the line works. Do the rich go to the head of the line or whatever? I don't know. I, I don't think that's right. Um, uh, I think healthcare, nationalized healthcare, is going to slow that process down. And I think that uh, since we, the population is growing older, people are going to get transplants more often. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know where to start. With this that. one's teed up for you, Doc. <laughs> yeah, it is indeed. Uh, in addition to me uh, being on a forum like this and getting questions from the audience, as I promised you and only served in three terms in Congress. The other thing that I want to do when I go to Congress is actually speak about this whole business of medical care, health care from the inside, because I've been doing this for more than half a century, and I know something about it. I know something about it firsthand, and so on and so forth. Uh, I really don't know how to begin to answer that question, except to keep in mind uh, what George Orwell said in Animal Farm, that we're all equal, except some are more equal than others. And anybody who thinks that somebody other than Dick Cheney would have gotten that heart transplant or that Ted Kennedy uh, would not have been able to go to Duke for his treatment of his brain cancer, you know, really doesn't understand what the world is right, what the world is like, I'm sorry. So George Orwell, George Orwell had it right. We're, we're all equal except some are more equal than others. And one of the things that I want to do when I go to Congress is speak about these things. Thank the you. way I want to speak about it is listening to you. Thank you. Well, I think this really comes down to the patient and the doctor and the family's decision. I do not think that this is something that the federal government ought to be involved in. I think that that's one of the fundamental problems with Obamacare, is that we're heading in that direction, and I'm, uh, I'm deeply concerned about federal government getting involved in making decisions about 
whether or not you can have a certain procedure done. I mean, that ought to be between you and your doctor, and ultimately a decision that's made at the family level, but not by the federal government, not by someone telling you what you can and cannot do medically. I think we need to stay, federal government needs to stay out of the business of health care and let you make your own decisions. Thank you. I had the great honor of, of going to present an award to a caregiver who left work at the age of, uh, he was in his 50s, to take care of his, uh, his mother who was 90 years old, having some health problems. He figured he would be off work for a few years. She lived to 105. Wow. And he was happy that he did it. Nobody knows how long you might live. And government shouldn't just run the odds and then you're stuck with the outcome. Life is too precious to do that. If we don't repeal Obamacare, that's the direction we're going. We, were gonna, we are going to have rationing, and rationing will come down to things like age, and it just shouldn't be that way. It's un-American. And not only that, but even people who want to pay for their own procedures because of the by, byproducts of, uh, of, of this limitation may find it less available. So there are dangers with Obamacare beyond just rationing for people who are, are getting the, the socialized type medicine. Uh, it's got to it's be turned around. What is the value of the life of a child? Each one of you are someone's child. And none of you would have your parents deny you a heart at 71 years old. Mrs. Pinkerton, would you please raise your hand so everybody can see you? That is the true face of bravery. Because if somebody came to you and said, I need a kidney, how many of you would just be scared to death to do that? So my hat's off to you. You have my vote. The fact, though, that government should not be in the equation, it is the doctor, it is the patient. Some are more equal than others. They planned well. They did their homework. They knew where to apply. You're in charge of your own health. You have to take that lead. You have to know Dr. Craig well enough to know that he can give you sound advice and you can get to the right location when you need it. So I would say this is the patient-doctor decision. The government should not be involved. Your lives are precious. Thank you. This is exactly why, one of the reasons why I'm running for Congress. I think the government is involved in too many decisions that they don't need to be. This is definitely the decision between the donor, the doctor, and the patient, and not the federal government. This, this question actually reminded me when I was studying Beijing under the communist government. They decided everything from what you were going to do, where you were going to work, and whether or not you got an education. And we can't allow this country to go that route. So we need to keep our freedoms, and we need to get government out of the way. I'm going to, thank you. I'm going to move, we have some questions from the audience. I think we'll just do two. Uh, two of you will do one question, and we'll just move through them, then we'll close it up. Um, we just finished here, so uh, Supervisor, would you start with the first one? Okay, let's start with the first one. We'll say, um, actually, because I want to, okay, yes. Um, kind of a little bit redundant, but under the Affordable Health Care Act, coverage is, you know, to be extended to more people. Um, do you agree that the mandate all Americans buy insurance to compensate for rising costs of treating the un or underinsured is beneficial? as a whole. Well, I don't think the federal government should be able to force anyone to buy anything. And uh, we can, one thing that could be done is that insurance companies could be allowed to compete across state lines. And uh, that, that's one thing that would, uh, would be a benefit. But uh, I think the individual mandate will probably be struck, struck down by the Supreme Court. And I think that's, that's a good thing because it'll make them go back to the drawing board. I think you're right. And so you don't see any benefit of having them? purchase the insurance to help the Americans? Well, it's theoretically okay, but if you think like um, like the Chinese government. Got it. Uh, Mayor, that will be your question as well. Do you see any benefit in mandating uh, healthier Americans buy insurance, theoretically, for lowering the cost of treating the un- or underinsured? Well, I work in this business, I sell health insurance every day, so I know that if everyone in this room has health insurance, costs go down. But the fact of the matter is, mandating that of you is, is unconstitutional, and I do believe that the Supreme Court will uh, strike down the law. 
but at the end of the day, I think what we need to do is increase competition, increase access, allow insurance companies to compete across state lines. I, I think that the only way we're going to drive down health care costs is to increase the competition, increase the access. So I don't believe in the individual mandate. I think it's unconstitutional. Um, your question will be different. Oh, different yeah, because I have to get through all of these here. Um, and you already addressed that one, so I'm going to give you this one here. Um, and I, I think one of the good things about this forum is that your, your parties aren't on your, your thing, so we can have an honest debate about how you really feel. But on this question, you, um, who do you support as the candidate for president, and uh, for your party's candidate for president? So they're assuming, I think, that you're Republican, but it says who, if you support Barack Obama, that's fine too, but who do you support for president? Yeah, based on the fact that you have, if you're a Republican, there are, there are four or five people yeah, in the race. Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney? Mitt Romney. And why? Well, I think he's been in the fray. You know, is it like Teddy Roosevelt used to say, you know, regard the man who's in the arena who's fighting the fight, you know, look at him favorably. And that's what Mitt Romney has done, not only this campaign, but four years ago. So I respect him for that. He doesn't exactly have every item his agenda that I agree with, and perhaps I agree more with some of the others, but using that as a touchstone, namely what Teddy Roosevelt said, I think Mitt Romney has demonstrated that he is a candidate, and I would support him. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Candidate Napolitano. Did I pronounce that right? I know you. Napolitano. Napolitano. Yes. Thank you. Um, right now, I like Sam Torum. I think his morals and ethics are the best out of all the candidates. Uh, but I will stand behind any of them that are nominated. Um, I, I just, I think sometimes people go for the one that has the most hair, or <laughs> the one that has or the tallest one, or the this or that, and they're not listening to what the candidate is saying sometimes. But no, I'll go with uh, Santorum, but I like, I'm beginning to like Romney a little more. I think he's coming out of the shell a bit more, becoming more conservative. And uh, for you three, I don't understand what this question says. Um, and you've already addressed this, so we're going to go with this. Uh, for the three of you, uh, do you believe in term limits and why? I like the idea of term limits, but my, I'll tell you my pause. When you get good leadership in there, you, the problem is when you're elected to an office every two years, you no longer walk in the door, then you're campaigning for your re-election in two more years. And so when the country has gone south like it has, when they, we've been sold out, when we've had so many people uh, heading our country in the wrong, wrong direction and our economy is devastated because of it, we want to throw them out of office. We want term limits. When you have good leadership and they're doing a good job, you want to keep them in there. So I have reservations about term limits because I think if you get the right people in office, you, you want them focusing on doing the job. So um, that's where I stand on term limits. Can I pick your Well, in 98, <clears throat> that was one of my main platforms when I run for U.S. Senate against Barbara Boxer as I stood for term limits. And I still do. And my wife um, at the Barstow thing held up her hands like this. Um, afterwards, I said, what was that about? What were you signaling me? She was saying, tell them you're for term limits. You're for term limits. Okay, so um, she didn't do it today, but yes, I support term limits. Once a person gets in there, they get so powerful, um, and that's why I waited till this time to run again, because we don't have an incumbent. That might be why everybody came out to run this time. Okay, there isn't an incumbent. There's a lot of machinery, a lot of power that goes to keep somebody in power. Thank you. Kennedy Adams. No, I absolutely do not support term limits. And I think uh, Greg makes a very compelling argument. The reality is, is you throw the baby out with the bathwater. It is very difficult to get good people to run and to serve and to be committed. And when you get a good leader, when you get somebody you can believe in and support, I want to keep that person there as long as I possibly can because they're doing good work and they should be rewarded for that. Throwing everybody out nilly-willy without any regard for their personal contribution and how they've committed themselves to leadership, 
I don't think it makes any sense. And I think, interestingly enough, when you look at, at just term limits in general, why would you want an unexperienced, naive member of your legislature? If I get burned really badly, I'd much rather have Dr. Craig with 30 plus years of medicine treating me than some guy who just got out of med school. And the same thing is true. I want my politicians who have to make incredibly difficult decisions every day to have the experience and the acumen to do the job well. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to read the question as it's stated, but then I'm, it, 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 it presumes something, so then I'll restate it, okay? Uh, the question is, what would you do to work across the aisle and get rid of gridlock in Congress? That was the question as stated. I'm going to ask, will you uh, reach across the aisle to get rid of gridlock in Congress, and why or why not? Well, I, I think that you have to in order to serve the people. Is, is be able to work across the aisle. But I won't do it at you know risking my values. Um, I'm pro-life and I'm not going to agree to abortion. Um, I'm not going to agree to increase taxes. But I will reach across the aisle and I will give them examples and ideas of what you can do. Like for instance, um, they wanted the uh, unemployment extended to 99 weeks. Okay, I can understand that people are still out, they're gonna lose their homes, all of that, but you know, why just give them something for free? Why not make them go to school so that we have a skilled workforce when the economy returns? And 99 weeks is more than enough time to get an associate's degree. Give them something as far as that um, to work with and, and learn to, to earn their keep. And that's how I was raised and, and that's how I will show them. And it, just in my life experiences, you can see that you can be somebody by pulling yourself up from the bootstraps and doing it for yourself. Uh, will you reach across the aisle to get rid of gridlock? Why or why not? I think that right now in Washington, D.C., there are a great number of conservative Democrats that are prepared to work with the conservative Republicans that are about to take the challenge. If I arrive in Washington, D.C. with your vote, the situation is to go in and seek out those Democrats that have some of these conservative values and who are not looking to socialize this country. I believe therein lies the majority of those people that are truly, truly uh, on a, what we would call a liberal path of entitlement. Um, there may be no compromise. I will not compromise when it comes to things like right to life. I will not compromise on the national security of this country, sealing the borders and defending this nation from a failed southern uh, country who allows uh, this type of activity with 30,000 plus people dead within a, a mere couple of years, hundreds of feet from our national uh, border. The United States government was formed Thank you. to defend this country first and foremost. Thank you. Okay, closing remarks. Let's start because you need to go first. So, uh, Kevin Adams, let's do it in a minute. Great. Thank you so much, first of all, David, for hosting us today. We really appreciate your time and your space. And thank you all for being here today and participating. At the end of the day, the reality is, without your participation, all this is for naught. It doesn't mean anything. We have to have people like you coming out, becoming involved, getting engaged, and most importantly, learning who the people are who want to represent you. I believe that I'm the best candidate for Congress. I have the legislative experience that's taught me how to work with everybody to get things done. There are many fine people up here. I have great respect for all of them. But the most legislative experience that any of these folks have is the ability to convince two other people to vote with them. The reality is I'm the only one who's had to work with everybody in a 120 member legislature and a governor to try to get things accomplished and I have a track record of proving that I can do that effectively. I very much believe that in limited government and the ability for the people to rise up and have a voice, I believe that I can be that voice for you and I would dearly ask for your vote. Thank you. I believe that Anthony Adams believes that he is the best one to represent you. but. I think he's wrong. I want to be the one representing you in the United States Congress. You've seen clearly that if I don't agree, I'm still going to tell you what I think. It's easy to preach to the choir. We had two nights of preaching to the choir. Thursday night and Friday night last night was plenty of preaching to the choir, saying things that folks wanted to hear. Sometimes what needs to be said is this is what I believe. I'm not going to change my position, but I will listen, I will engage you, and 
I think that it's time now that we do reach across the aisle. I will reach across to Republicans. Will Republicans reach across to Democrats? Because if you just say that you're going to abolish public education... Thank you. Oh, man. Oh, <laughs> you, uh, please stay afterwards to speak to all our seniors. Yes, sir. Thank you. Something that was not addressed is the economy and jobs through these questions, and that's one of the largest things facing this district. This country, but I say this district because we know that Washington hasn't been working, our state government hasn't been working, and we've got a bad economy, and we can even point and show how it's happening and why it's happening. But how do we fix it? How do we fix it here? Because I'm not willing to wait for the federal government to get their act straight or the state government to get their act straight. I think we can do some things different in our district and get people back to work here and forget about waiting on these other people. I've been out walking precincts. I've been all over this district. I've been hearing people's concern. I walked through a senior uh, mobile home park the other day and sat down with a woman that lives on a check from the government for $44 a month to eat for her food. That's all she has. While we're out spending money and doing all these other things, this is wrong. The government's not working. California's... Thank you. That was it? Okay. Oh. <laughs> Talk to me afterwards. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, boy, that's a big question. Uh, I, I really believe our whole entitlement uh, mentality uh, needs to be addressed. Um, I think our voting system needs to be addressed. Uh, I've been a precinct inspector for a long time. And I've seen the problems with voting, and that goes right to the heart of our entire democracy. So I don't care how good your intentions are, if the people aren't heard, it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to come across uh, as the truth. So I think that's very important, closing our, or not closing, but at least, at least finish the fence along the southern border. Because yeah, when, you, when you consider Canada, the United States has the longest border between two countries in the entire world, 2,000 miles. And we've never had a problem with that. Why is that? Uh, so, it, I could go on, but I just have a, a burning desire to help my country. And I will do whatever I can. Even if I'm not there, I'm going to be praying for it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dave. And thank the audience, and thank uh, Mr. Greiner, the day. So, uh, I think I'm the best one to uh, represent this district, and I say that uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, Jerry Lewis, when he was questioned uh, in the Sun newspaper uh, about people running for office, he, said, uh, he was asked, uh, do you think you have to have been in political office before? And his answer was, he said, I think there are a lot of talented people in the high desert. Uh, who can run for this office, and I think he was talking about me, because I ran against him three times. And uh, he knows me very well, and I know him pretty well, and things of that sort. Secondly, the second point I'd like to make is, my debate partner, uh, when I was in prep school, uh, was uh, Anthony Scalia on the Supreme Court. You may have heard about him, you may have heard some of the questions. So I would like to go to the Congress and reverse our positions here, Dave, where I would be asking the questions, the same kind of aggressive questions that uh, Justice Scalia asked when he's on the Supreme Court. I've been in the audience when he's questioned the attorneys, and he's very aggressive, and I think I'm going to be aggressive also. Polite, but aggressive. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, it's better to ask the questions than answer them, for sure. Well, again, thank you all for being here today. I think it, it's an important thing that, that you come out and you get the chance to hear what we all have to say. Uh, with all due respect to uh, one of my opponents down here at the end, Anthony Adams, I think getting two votes is much more difficult than getting 30. Uh, and when you vote to raise taxes um, on your very citizens that you told you would not raise taxes on, I think you break promises. And I will not break that promise to you. Again, I have voted, uh, or I have signed the American Protection Taxpayer Pledge, and I will not break that promise. I will not vote to raise taxes. I have not voted to raise taxes on the city council, raise fees. I will not vote to raise those taxes or fees. And I think what you need to think about when you're looking at who you're going to consider voting for is people that can get things done. Ladies and gentlemen, as you drive down the I-15 freeway, Armagosa or Mariposa Road, as you see the La Mesa and Interchange getting done, 
and getting built. Remember, that would not have happened had it not been for me in getting that, getting those votes to put that thing in construction. Thank you. So thank you. I request your vote. I'd also like to thank everybody for attending, and thank you for hosting us. I. Uh, I will not be able to stay afterwards because I am a county supervisor and I have county business down the hill, so I'll be leaving as soon as we're done up here. But, uh, you know, I, in that job, have a lot of different responsibilities. And it's actually hundreds of votes that I have to work through for regional issues. I was happy to support uh, Brian McEachern when the city came to Sandbag and asked Sandbag to help them complete the Nisqually Interchange. I was president of Sandbag at that time. We have better regional cooperation than we've had in a long time, probably ever. And, uh, you know, I've been going to Washington every year, and I'm really getting tired of them not dealing with the problems, the problems that are holding us back, laws that they need to reform that are killing jobs, and refusing to pass a transportation bill so we can get our highways fixed and get our highways done. Every year I go, and every year they delay because they're tied up in partisan gridlock. So I want to change that. I appreciate your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Bill Jensen. A vote for me will send a clear message to Washington, D.C. and let the others know in Congress that there are people like me that are here to fight the fight. I will defend and protect the Constitution and all of the laws that we pass will be grounded or repealed as such. I will defend and protect this nation militarily. I will cut the federal spending and reduce the government wherever I can. I will ensure that a profitable Social Security and Medicare system and policy exists. I will downsize, if not eliminate, the EPA and the overreaching government regulations through departments of energy, etc. I look forward to sitting on the Oversight Committee with Congressman Issa, on the Armed Services Committee with Congressman McKeon, and the Budget Committee with Paul Ryan to make these tough decisions and let them know that there's one more ally in the hallways that's not afraid to go down the hallway and knock on 453 doors and make sure that we find the coalitions that we need to turn this government around, pay attention Thank to the you. Constitution. Thank you very much. Thank you for attending today and thank you for hosting. Dave, well, you have, you have a lot of choices to make and all of us here are, are qualified and willing to serve this country. But what I can offer you is someone who has been down here and made it up here and knows how to do it and knows the price of gas and can do it on her own. And as you know of my, my fight on city council, my voice is not silenced. I will continue to expose the wrong and I will continue to fight for the right. And Brad Metzenfeld is completely correct that Nisqually Interchange was only built because Sandbag had to bail out the city of Victorville because they didn't have the funds to build. And that is why I voted no on that project, because that is what is wrong with the government today. They continue to spend what they don't have, and there was no funding sources in place at the city of Victorville for that Nisqually Interchange. So that is why I voted no for that project. And I thank Sandbag for bailing out Victorville so that we can have that project. Thank you. And that's the common sense I will bring to government. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everyone. David, could you come up here, please? Um, Dave Greiner and I co-founded the High Desert Senior Forum 16 months ago. And I think you said at the beginning we had four people. And we took a little heat for today's uh, forum. And I want to thank you, David, for standing up for what we believe, because at the end of the day, it's all about you, our seniors, and bringing what you asked us to bring were the candidates. I want to thank all the congressional people who showed up here today. David and I thank you immensely for taking the time, and to all of you that are running for supervisor, they're all still here. And also, will all of the sponsors all of our co-sponsors, please stand up that help David and I every month. Connie, Joyce, senior advisors. We, we cannot do this every month if it wasn't for these people. We pay for this out of our own pockets and we do it because of you, our seniors. I want to let you know that next month on May 3rd at 9 o'clock here is the next senior forum. Our own Kirk Cassidy from Senior Planning Advisories will be doing 
information on financial planning. There are still plenty of coffee, fruit, desserts. Most of our candidates are going to stick around for a little bit. Those that must leave, their representatives will be here to meet with you. Please feel free to talk to them. If they didn't answer a question, this is the time to ask them. On behalf of Dave Greiner and all of us, thank you. Have a wonderful month. Thank you so much.